Hello, everyone. My name is Carol Werner, and I'm the executive director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And I want to welcome you all here to this briefing this afternoon to look at the whole issue of carbon accounting and vehicle fuels and to go through and uh, we have an opportunity to provide uh, a research update to really look at this issue in terms of looking at the latest information that is available that takes into account all of the different changes that have been happening with regard to, to inputs, technology changes, all sorts of, of exciting changes that uh, are really making a difference in how we measure and account for carbon. And it's very, very important as we move forward in so many different areas, as we look at ways to address greenhouse emissions, uh, how we address climate, how we address energy in this country, to make sure that we really have the latest information and and are really looking at things in a holistic way. So we are very privileged this afternoon to have uh, a, a terrific panel that are doing uh, work in this whole area that is really the sort of the cutting edge of research, the people who are really the go-to folks with regard to research in this whole area of looking, looking at life cycle analysis, uh, looking at the models that have been developed and put together and are continuously evolving and being updated. Uh, and our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Michael Wang, who is Senior Scientist for Energy Systems at Argonne National Laboratory. And he has been leading the ongoing development of Argonne's GREET model, uh, which stands for Greenhouse Gases, Regulated Emissions, and Energy Use in Transportation. Uh, Michael has been working on this model as seen as the premier modeler and, and uh, uh, analyst with regard to this whole issue, has been working with uh, not only with folks throughout the United States and uh, state and federal agencies with regard to this, but he's also done much collaboration with automotive companies, energy companies, uni other universities, research uh, institutes, uh, not in the United States, but also around the world, and particularly in Canada, Brazil, uh, and uh, the EU. So I would, at this time, like to turn the podium over to Dr. Michael Wang. Carol, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, EESI, to uh, organize this uh, briefing. And it is a privilege to come here to talk to everybody about our result from the grid model. And uh, as you can see from uh, this slide, the grid model is a model of our fuels. And we have uh, petroleum-based fuels, natural gas, electricity for uh, electric vehicle applications, and hydrogen for fuel cell vehicle applications. So biofuel is uh, one of the many fuel options we include in our evaluation for the Department of Energy and uh, many other agencies. So you know, today, of course, the topic is about biofuels at core ethanol and cellulosic ethanol. So this is the flow chart to show you the system boundary we include in our life cycle analysis of uh, ethanol. And this is core to ethanol as an uh, example. So as you can see from this slide, we include uh, most, if not all, the activities included in the life cycle of uh, ethanol production. There are three key stages I cover today, farming, ethanol production, and uh, direct and uh, indirect land use change, as you see here. There are two other issues, vehicle usage and uh, the coal product uh, from ethanol plant. These two are important issues as well, but today I'm not going to uh, cover these two issues. So for a farming stage, this chart, uh, ethanol production, this chart shows you the historical trend of ethanol 
plant energy use from 1970s all the way to 2010. Of course, we all know the U.S. ethanol program started in 1980. So yeah, back then, yeah, the oil studies and ethanol plant energy use data, as you can see, the energy use could be as high as uh, over 100,000 BTU per gallon of ethanol produced. But that has been reduced uh, to be now 30,000 BTU per gallon of ethanol produced. If you look at uh, recent trend, uh, the downtrend continues. Of course, Dr. Stefan Mueller is going to show you the details of the technology advancement, so what's behind the downtrend uh, in ethanol plant. Uh, this chart shows you the chemicals used per bushel of ethanol produced uh, over the last 40-some uh, years. So again, we see a downtrend for fertilizer use per bushel of corn harvested. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, for people... Yeah, I, you know, I was far behind. So this chart shows you the three key areas I cover basically farming, ethanol production, direct and indirect land use change. Uh, these two are the uh, vehicle use and uh, you know, coal product DGS I'm not going to touch on. And as I said, this is the chart of ethanol plant uh, energy use in the last 30-some uh, years. And uh, of course, the downtrend continues. And uh, Stefan is going to uh, tell us more what's behind the downtrend in the last uh, 10 years. This chart shows you the uh, chemicals used for corn farming. So over the last uh, 40 years, we've seen downtrend of chemicals used per bushel of corn harvested in the U.S. And there are several key reasons for this downtrend. And so those are some of the key factors wrought into our life cycle analysis for corn to ethanol. And uh, this chart shows you the greenhouse gas emission sources for corn ethanol will pass away. For example, the ethanol plant is still the largest uh, greenhouse gas emission source for, for corn ethanol. And that's because we still use nature gas as uh, our energy source for steam production ethanol plant. And the next significant source is uh, N2O and CO2 from fertilizer used in, in farms. Uh, so these together it's 14 grams per megajoule. And uh, I uh, would point up to the CO2 emission is from lime in the field. Uh, we we'll evaluate, uh, in fact, we we'll re-evaluate uh, CO2 from lime uh, in grit. Uh, there are some trends. Uh, we may overestimate uh, CO2 emissions from lime. Uh, there are some other sources, as you can see from this pie chart. So land use change. We uh, develop a module called C Club uh, inside of grid. So C Club is a module to uh, generate uh, greenhouse gas emissions for land use change specifically. But C Club take input from two important models for land use change. We uh, rely primarily on produce G type model. Uh, that's on general equilibrium model to generate uh, land use change for a given volume of uh, ethanol production. On the other hand, for soil carbon changes, we relied on the century model developed in Colorado State University with support from USDA and EPA in Colorado State. So these are the two important models we relied on to simulate land use change for biofuel productions. The C Club, of course, take into account different uh, teenage practices and different lead conversions to generate lead use change result. Uh, this is a summary of the lead use change GHG result for corn ethanol from, 19, from uh, 2008 up to 2014. So as you can see, over time, uh, 
There are many organizations put a tremendous amount of effort to address land use change. And you, you see you know, the downtrend from the first study all the way to 2014. But uh, variations still you know, exist. So you know, there the question is, what are the causes for this uh, you know, downtrend? And there are several, there are several factors to uh, affect uh, land use change GHG emissions. Crop, crop yield in existing crop land versus new land at global yield differences at potentials. So these are important factors wrought into CGE models to generate result. The next uh, group is available land types. So we know crop land, grass land, forest land, wetland, etc. So different lands can roll into crop land to, uh, to grow corn and other grains. And of course, in the last uh, several years, significant amount of effort made into those models to update the uh, land availability in those models. And then there are some uh, important uh, economical parameters in the models. For example, price elasticities, specifically crop yield response to a price, food demand response to a price. So these are a few important factors to affect uh, CGE model up, uh, output. Then you know, how to address animal feed in the CGE models. This has been an issue from 2008 all the way to 2012. And now, my opinion is uh, all the models now have a good handling of uh, animal feed in, in modeling. Of course, soil organic carbon change from land conversions based on century models and some other databases, or even RPCC tier one, tier two emission sources. Of course, you know, we see variations still exist, uh, even at, even as of now, if you look at uh, California's 2014 result versus uh, some other recent result, we still see a range of 10 to 23 grams per megajoule. But even more so, if we look at uh, the EPA's 2010 result, uh, we see uh, three numbers. Uh, of course, EPA used the 2022 result for the final RFS uh, two ruling, but EPA generates 2012 and 2017 numbers for, in my opinion, for model configuration. So the question, of course, is uh, why there is a significant reduction from 2012 to 2022 for land use change. At the same time, our biofuel production volume goes up. So you know, that's why you know, I conclude uh, the 2012 and the 2017 numbers are not uh, so reliable numbers for policy uh, purpose, but it is for model configuration, of course, uh, this has generated some confusion in the biofuel debate. So to roll all the results into a grid, uh, and this is uh, the summary of uh, what, we, what we see from grid modeling to put all those critical factors in. So as you can see, corn ethanol versus gasoline, we see, even with lead use change include, we see a reduction in 25 to 33% range. And uh, of course, when we move to sugarcane, corn store, sweet grass, miscances, the so-called second generation biofuels, we have significant, significantly increased uh, GHG reductions. And uh, you know, some uh, of us may still wonder the energy balance uh, debate uh, of core ethanol, whether core ethanol has positive energy balance or negative energy balance. And uh, here is uh, our great uh, simulated result. So we conclude because the advancement in farming at ethanol plant uh, 
core arsenal indeed has a positive energy balance. In fact, the energy balance uh, is uh, 10 pot one megajoule per liter of arsenal produced uh, in terms of energy ratios about 1.6. Of course, uh, other you know, second generation biofuels has a larger energy ratio. So, some new trends for uh, ethanol production. We know in the last uh, several years, ethanol plants start to extract uh, uh, oil and they to use the extracted oil for biodiesel production. So we now can fake the biodiesel production from corn oil in grid 2014. So you're going to see grid 2014 in two weeks. And another new trend is called, is called production of corn grain based ethanol and store based ethanol. And we've seen the uh, point uh, plant just came online you know, a few weeks ago, and uh, this is where the two plants co located. So you have some heat integration to benefit uh, both sides. Uh, both sides of the fence. So we are examining this new, unique co-production of ethanol in grid 2014. So now I quickly go through our result for petroleum to gasoline. So this flow chart summarizes, sorry, I had better focus on the screen. So this flow chart summarizes our system boundary for petroleum to gasoline. Of course, we include uh, all the major activities for gasoline pathway, as you see in this flow chart. And uh, in the last uh, year also, we start to address a few critical issues for petroleum fuel pathways. For example, we spent a considerable amount of effort to address petroleum refining to gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and others with LP modeling effort to address refinery efficiency and emissions. And we have two journal articles published to address to document our findings. And for oil sand, we update energy use at GHG emissions of recovery activities with Stanford University. And we address the land disturbance related GHG emissions with UC Davis. So the results are rolled into a grid 2014. At this point, we are analyze some other crude types. For example, the not crude production in in the Balkan play and the not crude production in Eagle Ford play, especially the uh, nature gas flare in the Balkan play. So we anticipate to have a result in a few months to roll into a grid. So this is a summary of our petroleum refining modeling results. So this is a product specific efficiency. So here you see the gasoline efficiency, diesel efficiency, jet fuel efficiency, residual oil, LPG, and coke. And uh, the variation represents uh, the variation of the 43 U.S. refineries we simulated in this effort. So, you know, put this into a uh, grid. Here is the result uh, for uh, gasoline. So, with the update, uh, we see the gasoline carbon footprint is about 95 grams per megajoule. And uh, on the other hand, if we you know, look at uh, closely the uh, oil sand result, so with our collaboration with uh, Stanford University at UC Davis, we addressed uh, 25 oil sand projects in uh, Alberta. So here are the project uh, distribution in Northern Alberta. So we have both uh, uh, mining operations and in situ operations. And uh, here are the results uh, from this effort. So the table above grid 2013 is what we have now. The new result is grid 2014 update, as you see. So we see significant, well, somewhat increase in oil sand related uh, 
passive carbon intensity. For example, for mining operation, we increased from about 32 grams to about uh, 41 to 31 percent, depending on the type of product. For in situ, we increased from 35 grams to about 43 to 51 grams. So, so these are the new results you are going to see in GRID 2014. So just quickly in conclusion, technology improvements in ethanol plant at core farming have helped reduce core ethanol GHG emissions. Land use change modeling for core ethanol has improved in the past six years with reduced moderate land use change GHG emissions. But uncertainties and confusions remain. Uh, the debate continues, and uh, we all know the debate continues. And so this is a where I hope that uh, the community together can uh, you know, address this together, because we know what are the key factors drive uh, the result differences, and uh, the community agencies together can uh, get some of the issues resolved uh, so we can have uh, some uh, you know, better result and uh, some uh, more transparencies in what are the critical factors to cause this important uh, fact, uh, result. And on the other hand, the transition to cellulosic biofuels will result in greater GHG reductions. Uh, thanks you for your time. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, and I think, as, as you said, there have been a lot of changes. There has been a lot of uncertainty, uh, a lot of confusion, and much, much discussion. And it is really important to see how um, we can move forward um, for a common good and to really make sure that we're also putting things in their appropriate context. Our next speaker is Dr. Stefan Mueller, who is a principal economist with the Energy Resources Center, University of Illinois at Chicago, where he is directing research in the areas of biofuel and bioenergy at the Energy Resources Center. Uh, this work really focuses on resource assessments for biofuel, bioenergy production processes, and their life cycle analyses. He's also working on a geospatial platform to help assess land use changes at a field level scale that can be very useful then in terms of this tool being used by all sorts of users. Um, so uh, as, as they also seek to manage risk. Dr. Muller? Thank you very much. Uh, give me a second here, yeah, I gotta pull up the uh, presentation. Okay, <clears throat> well thanks uh, for having me. Uh, I, uh, oh, so, Basically, I want to fill in a little bit of the, uh, you know, elaborate a little bit on what Michael had said, explain a little bit more on the technology side, um, and uh, why, uh, what's behind the sort of the lower trend in greenhouse gas emissions or life cycle emissions from, from corn ethanol. Um, well, basically, we've seen uh, protection uh, technologies, new production technologies um, going into the, uh, in, into the uh, corn ethanol process, both at the plant level and during feed, feedstock production. Um, the, main, the main drivers um, for that were the RFS2, right, which clearly for renewable fuels mandated certain energy efficient technologies like combined heat and power um, uh, technologies. Um, it's also a, uh, a state of, an, of the innovation cycle we are with, uh, with uh, corn ethanol, right? It's, a, it's really a relatively young technology compared to petroleum refineries, right? And young technologies have a lot of potential to grow, to adopt new technologies, to improve efficiency improvements, and we've seen that. And thirdly, uh, lately, uh, ethanol plants have been uh, productive, uh, have been uh, profitable, and they have invested that capital into energy uh, efficient uh, technologies and new processing 
uh, technologies. And lastly, I want to mention that there are technologies out there that can uh, prove and ensure long term the sustainability of corn ethanol production, and we need to look into those as well. This is a list that's hard to read, and it's hard to read because there are a lot of new technologies going into ethanol plants, right? I mentioned combined heat and power technologies, which are more really traditional industrial energy technologies, energy efficiency technologies. Um, but there's also new processing technologies, like selective uh, grinding technology, protein recovery, uh, more sophisticated uh, animal feed production uh, at the back end, which is a very important uh, point for corn ethanol plant, is the animal feed production. It's a big component, and I'll come to back, back to that later. Um, and then that's on the plant side, just on the ethanol plant side. Then on the, um, on the feedstock production side and the corn production side, we've also seen large pushes in technologies, new hybrids, uh, GPS technologies, auto steer on tractors, uh, variable rate uh, nutrient applicators, uh, nitrification inhibitors that prevent runoff of fertilizer. So it's been a very vibrant and active uh, field in that space. And what have all these technologies brought? Well, on the plant side, we've seen a significant reduction in thermal energy use, meaning natural gas use. Uh, going back from in, just in 2001, we used 36,000 BTUs to produce a gallon of corn ethanol. In 2012, we used 23, roughly 24,000 BTUs per gallon. During the same time, we've seen a 7% yield increase at the plants. Electricity use has also gone down uh, during the tam uh, same time frame. And one of the uh, technologies that Michael mentioned that we've seen rapid adoption in is corn oil separation, right? The, the production of a separate fuel product, because most of the corn oil goes into the biodiesel market or the animal feed market from that same feedstock. We've also seen a reduction in water use um, from about five gallons, you know, a only a couple years ago to now, now about 2.5 uh, gallons per gallon of uh, ethanol produced, 2.7 gallons per gallon of ethanol produced. One point I want to make is we're obviously, obviously a huge supporter of, uh, of the RFS2 and have provided uh, off and on data and, and review. Um, you know, the new modeling, in my opinion, is needed or an updated modeling is needed at, at EPA to reflect these new numbers. Back when RFS2 was modeled, they used the latest numbers, they used good numbers, but it's a, it's a very rapidly advancing industry and technology, and we need to update the numbers there. I've just shown you what happened on the plant level. Well, on the corn feedstock level, right, we have seen, uh, no, no surprise, uh, record yields this year. We're going to be expecting 170 bushels per acre on average across the U.S., across the 2,500 counties that grow corn. Um, and that is significantly up from the five-year trend. But even last year, was were actually very high yields. We had very high yields. And even during the drought year, I want to mention, in 2012, uh, we did not have a crop failure, as would have been expected from the prevailing weather pattern. We still grew a very sizable and, and robust uh, crop back then. And that is true due to the new, met uh, the new technologies, right? The new sea technologies. Um, the new uh, seats, um, and the new economic practices. A couple, of, uh, uh, you know, a couple of technologies worth mentioning here, especially corn kernel fiber to ethanol. New enzyme manufacturing, new enzyme products uh, really make it possible to turn uh, you know, between six or eight, or sometimes potentially 10% of corn kernel fiber, uh, well, to turn corn kernel fiber into about six, or 10% of additional ethanol uh, at traditional starch ethanol plants. And that's cellulosic ethanol, right? Eligible for D3 rinse. We've seen quad county processors adopting that technology, just started up in July very successfully. Um, remember when I told you that corn oil separation was very rapidly adopted within five years by almost all plants? There is a potential for that technology to be rapidly adopted as well, because it's ready. And the potential with that is, is 1 billion gallons of cellulosic ethanol just out of the existing fleet 
of current starch ethanol plants. Uh, example two is corn replacement feed. I want to talk to, about that just for a little bit because uh, it, 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 it really goes, speaks to the land requirements for corn ethanol production. What's been happening is that higher corn yields uh, have also increased the amount of plant residue that is uh, left after the harvest. And it's becoming a management issue. So a lot of growers have started to remove it. And many times it goes into bedding or it goes into, um, into animal feed. Into an animal feed. If you pre treat it with 5% lime to increase digestibility, it can go into an animal feed. What that does is if you... Obviously, the, the, the removal rate vary by region, right? There's a certain sustainable removal rate, um, you know, beyond which it does not significantly impact soil health. And we have to be very mindful of that, right? That we do not deteriorate so soil health. But the, per the perfect or the appropriate removal rates can be pretty easily determined. So if, for example, at 170 bushel per acre yield, uh, field, we remove 30% of, uh, of corn stover, Right? That's equivalent to producing an extra 50 bushel of corn from that field. Again, it's like getting a 30% land use credit. That is animal feed um, grown on land. That's not, not the, basically, it's, it's, we don't need this land to grow this portion of animal feed. It's a land use credit. The same is true uh, for DDGs, and in, in my opinion, it's very poorly understood in the press, right? I repeatedly read articles in, my, in, 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 in major publications that say the government diverts nearly 40% of the U.S. corn crop for ethanol. That is true, but it's only the partial truth, right? And it's basically an omission of the other half. And that means that there is about 40%, it's probably closer to 35% of the corn crop is diverted um, to corn. But if we account properly for the land saved from animal feed production, right, the net acreage is much closer to 25%, and that's under conservative yield assumption, and not under the high yields we've seen this year and last year. In this case, it would be much lower, it'd be closer to 19% um, of, of corn being diverted to ethanol, counting the land use credit from DDGs. And I want to uh, conclude my uh, presentation with um, the thought that I said earlier. I think it is important to prove and, and record the, the sustainability of the industry, whether this is during RIN verification, as the EPA has instituted quality assurance programs that verify that a RIN is truly a RIN, and prevents fraud. So we all know if you buy a gallon of, of uh, renewable fuel, uh, you know, it was produced under renewable conditions and it is what it is, very important. Um, there are also third party verifiers out there. There's tool being developed that allows, um, that allows benchmarking of fields, farm, farms, uh, uh, to see where they rank in their, in their sustainer sustainability efforts and the certification agencies out there, out there like International Sustainability and Carbon Certification that certified a lot of ethanol going into the EU back when there was still a market before the EU imposed a tariff. Um, but I think sustainability efforts uh, should be um, supported. With that, I am done. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stefan. I think it's been very important in terms of hearing from Michael with regard to thinking about how um, new data has been very important in terms of, of updating the modeling process in terms of looking at life cycle analysis for, for biofuels and, and also for petroleum. And hearing from Stefan with regard to what all's going on with regard to changes in, in terms of technology and land use. Now we're going to hear from Dean Drake, who's really going to be looking at the changing economics that are involved as well. And Mr. Drake, uh, brings an interesting background in terms of having uh, spent 34 years at General Motors, most of it, which was in corporate public policy. And while there, uh, helped 
uh, organized or initiated GM's Conference on Global Warming that goes clear back to 1989. He's been involved in terms of looking at uh, uh, the development of various policies. He's been involved in the President's Council on Sustainable Development, uh, as well as being involved in projects with Yale University's Next Generation Environmental Management Issues. He is the president of the uh, D4 group, and through which he is now doing so much of his economic analysis work. So we are very pleased to welcome Dean Drake. Well, thank you for having me. And as by far the oldest of the presenters, I hope I can get along with this new technology. Uh, as was said, I have been around for a while, worked for General Motors for 34 years, retired in 1999, which is far enough back that it's, I've been away from General Motors longer than a statute of limitations on most crimes. In 2007, I organized a, a, a consulting company where uh, I incorporated or brought in a lot of my fellow retired uh, people from General Motors that I worked with, and I won't go through their qualifications because I have to get through a lot of slides in 15 minutes. So I'm trusting you can read faster than I can talk. But basically, uh, together, the people in the DeFore group plus uh, Tom Darlington of uh, uh, AIR and Gary Herwick, together we have about a century worth or more of experience in the automotive industry. And, and some of our people have uh, experience in government and academia as well. And what started this whole thing is that we were talking several years ago about what the fuel of the future might be. And that led us to apply for a grant to the state of Minnesota, which graciously granted us some grant money. And we started looking at this issue. And a lot of strange things happened along the way as we were looking at this issue. One of the things, if you're one of these geriatric ninjas like myself, you realize the biggest danger are things that you absolutely know to be true that have changed. And what we found coming at it from kind of an independent perspective and starting to look at this whole issue of ethanol and and corn ethanol in particular, what we found was nothing but assumptions that we had to go back to the drawing board and change. I'd like to start out first of all by talking a little bit of the fundamentals if you're going to look at the economic benefits of ethanol. Now, there are several components. The first one obviously is how much does ethanol cost per gallon compared to gasoline. If gasoline and ethanol cost the same, we refer to that as volumetric price parity, or VPP. However, since 2011, ethanol has sell, sold for less than gasoline by a substantial amount. So that all results in a net benefit for ethanol. The second thing is its octane boosting potential. Uh, octane, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, is basically a fuel's ability to uh, resist pre-ignition. The whole idea of a spark ignition engine is you want the gasoline air mixture to fire when the spark plug tells it to. If the fuel explodes before that, you have a problem. So the measure of how well a fuel resists pre-ignition is called its octane rating. And no fuel is perfect. In the case of gasoline, it inherently has a low octane rating. So it has to be boosted somehow. They used to do that with lead, but found out that was not such a good idea. Um, ethanol inherently has a very high octane rating, uh, well over 110. And the idea of octane is important because when they took the lead out, they had to reduce the octane rating of gasoline, which meant if you're an old guy like me, you remember when all the engines had to be detuned to run on new unleaded gasoline. And so there's a potential efficiency loss that was incurred there that now that we're interested in greenhouse gases and mile per gallon, we need to get back. And then finally, there's the energy penalty with ethanol. As you all know, ethanol sells for, or has 30, about 32% less energy than regular gasoline. 
but only sells for 19% less. So it's important, and I'll be discussing a lot, energy price parity, where a dollar's worth of ethanol contains the same amount of energy as the dollar's worth of gasoline. That's kind of the holy grail in ethanol economics. And surprisingly, we're getting there. So first of all, why does ethanol now cost less than gasoline? And this is kind of an interesting story, and, and this is kind of where our group started. If you take a look at how ethanol and gasoline prices tracked between the beginning of the RFS2 and the end of 2011, they pretty much tracked the same. There are some places where there are gaps, but if you average it out over that period, they're like within a couple cents of each other. However, beginning in January 2012, uh, ethanol became cheaper than gasoline on a volume basis uh, and averaged about 52 cents a gallon, and they continue to be different. And being kind of a curious person and into economics, we wondered why that happened. And the one thing that correlated was the expiration of the tax credit for corn ethanol and the lifting of the tariff on imported ethanol at the end of 2011. That seemed to change everything. Well, if you start looking at the economics of corn ethanol producers, you can kind of see what happened. Uh, when they started out, it was not really a very profitable business, but over the years, they managed to get the return up, and then the tax credit and tariff protection went away. They had what economists might think of as a near-death experience, um, as you see, their profits for the next couple of years dropped below their capital costs. And what this chart doesn't show is where it looks like it went down to zero, it actually went negative. And through a lot of innovation, which you was alluded to by the earlier speakers, the corn ethanol producers managed to return to profitability, selling their ethanol at an average of 52 cents a gallon less than gasoline. This is one of those interesting times when the invisible hand of the market has a green thumb because all of the things that they had to do to improve their bottom line happened to be things that also improved their greenhouse gas footprint. So uh, this, but, and I won't go into this because I think the other speakers were far more knowledgeable in this than I am, but it's interesting to note that the Institute for Transportation Studies at the University of California, Davis, never known to be a real friend of corn ethanol, even notices the same trends, that new processes have been adopted in 80% of the plants. The plants are more energy efficient now. Uh, there was also a great consolidation of plants during the period of no profits right after the tax credit and uh, the uh, tariff protection expired. So a lot of things happened, what economists call creative destruction, and it resulted in a much different corn ethanol production uh, infrastructure than existed before 2012. Now, at the same time, and be because of both the economics of ethanol and the RFS, the oil industry kind of modified its processes. Uh, it used to be that oil companies, refineries, would produce gasoline that could be directly shipped to the retailers. They don't do that anymore. Because to, to sell it legally, gasoline has to have 87 octane, what's called anti-knock index, or AKI. And what the oil industry has done is created instead a blend stock that has 84 AKI. They ship that through the pipelines to blenders, and the blenders then add 10% ethanol to it with its higher uh, content, octane content, and boosting the octane up to the legal minimum. So really, any of the gas you buy today really isn't pure gasoline. It's 10% ethanol, or what we refer to as E10. Because, as I'll indicate in a minute, that's the lowest cost per unit of energy, or BTU, that you can make is blending gasoline with 10% ethanol. The infrastructure is now tailored to it, and the customers, by and large, universally accept it. In other words, if 
it was decided to eliminate ethanol. And ethanol disappeared from the world tomorrow, there would be a tremendous problem because ethanol is now essential to making motor fuel. The stuff that comes out of refineries can't be put in the gas tanks. So that's another thing that changed I thought was interesting. The bottom line here is that like milk, studies about the economics of ethanol tend to have an expiration date. You probably shouldn't use it unless if it was done before 2012. In fact, some of the government models that model the economics of uh, ethanol actually have built into them the old assumption that ethanol and gasoline cost the same per gallon. They don't anymore. And even if the study was released after 2012, you have to kind of dig through it. There's the NERA study that API put out, and I have a lot of respect for NERA. They're one of the really good economic uh, analysis firms. And they published a report in October 2012. Well, it turns out that the phase one of that report that everything was based on was actually published in November 2011, before anybody foresaw what the effect of the elimination of the tax credit and tariff protection would do to the economics of ethanol. Similarly, the latest CBO report has 21 studies in it that were published before 2012. So if you go through that report and take a Sharpie and mark out the findings from all the older reports, it's a much different report with much different findings than the one most of you have read. So now I want to go to, on to Octane because that's really what I'm excited about as a former engineer and auto person and I'm kind of nuts about cars. I would like to see more of it. Uh, ethanol. Well, first of all, octane can be done two ways. As I said, blend stock is 84 octane, can't be used in the car. It has to be boosted at least another three octane points to be legal. You can either do that at the refinery or you can do it using ethanol. If you do it at the refinery, it's going to cost money to take that lower octane blend stock and boost it. Now, there's a number of different studies. How you calculate what that cost is is kind of a... Uh, a uh, controversial subject and the oil companies aren't exactly forthcoming on those sorts of things. So there are three studies that I looked at. The one that we did which came up with 11 cents a gallon to get that additional three octane. APF economics calculated using different methodology at 11 to 17 cents and Hart Energy came up with 14 cents. So I think our 11 cents uh, looks pretty good all things considered. So that's what it would cost if you didn't have ethanol. Now if you use ethanol and add that 10%, you can boost the octane by three octane points, making the gas legal and reduce the price of the pump by five cents a gallon because ethanol is cheaper. Now, so that's the difference at the pump price. If you use pure gasoline, it's gonna cost 11 cents a gallon more than blend stock. If you use ethanol, it's going to cost five cents a gallon less than the blend stock. So even after you consider the energy difference that I talked about, right now it looks like gasoline to the consumer is about six cents a gallon cheaper because ethanol is used to boost octane rather than trying to do it to the refinery. Now you multiply that over 120 billion gallons and you know, Everett McKinley Dirksen said a dollar here and a dollar there and pretty soon you have real money. Um, so, this octane benefit can even be applied to higher blends of ethanol. Now, there's the highest blend right now for sale is E85 or 85% ethanol. And it's never been a value proposition for consumers. But some enterprising ethanol producers, now to make fuel ethanol, you have to denature it because after all, if you didn't, people would be more likely to put it in their cocktails than their gas tank. So they denature it by putting in, the oil companies do, by putting in blend stock by 2 to 5%. The ethanol producers, they, they do it by putting in something called natural gasoline, which is actually a natural gas compound. It's a liquid that has very much similar properties to gasoline, but it only has about 40 to 50 AKI octane. Of course, if you insert that into ethanol, that doesn't make any difference. So these ethanol producers said, why don't we put more in? 
create E85 and sell it directly to retailers. And that's happening all over the Midwest. It's uh, In Michigan, they call it the Yellow Hose Program. And so what happens when you do that is I, we had calculated you needed to sell E85 at 72 cents a gallon less than regular in order to make it a good value proposition. In the Yellow Hose Program, it sells for a dollar a gallon less than regular. And this is not hypothetical. That picture I have happens to be the ethanol or the E85 pump nearest me. And they've been running ethanol, E85, at about a dollar a gallon less for months and months. That's where I fill up my FFV because I'm basically very cheap. Um, now, it turns out that this is largely the octane effect plus the advantage of selling directly to retailers. But if the oil companies were to use a very low octane uh, gasoline instead of blend stock to make their E85, they could be selling it for a buck a gallon less than regular too. And the stations that are doing that, by the way, are finding improved profits as a result of switching to the stuff uh, direct that's produced with the natural gasoline. So that octane boosting effect the, the economic benefits of boosting octane with ethanol go all the way up to E85. But the real question we ask is, what's the sweet spot? What's the best blend? Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. But first, I want to point out, I mentioned energy uh, price parity earlier. Now, it turns out that depending on who you look at or what studies you look at, that may happen soon or may happen later. But it, if you, this is a chart that shows ethanol, price of ethanol as a fraction of the price of gasoline. Now, if you get down there, you see my energy price parity line. The University of Missouri estimates that the price of ethanol versus gasoline will fall and actually be below energy price parity this year. The CBO in their report, and you have to go to a footnote to find this because they don't really trumpet it, but they looked at futures prices and decided that by 2017, the price of ethanol would be about the same of that as gasoline on an energy basis. So here's two different groups coming up with basically the same idea. Sooner or later, ethanol is going to be selling cheaper on an energy basis than gasoline. And that, of course, changes everything. Almost anything you put ethanol in will be cost effective. But then we ask ourselves, What's the most cost-effective way to use ethanol? And the most cost-effective way is to maximize its octane-boosting potential. And now there's various names for what you might call this concoction. We like to call it eco-performance fuel, or EPF. Um, you know, I hope to get royalties on the name tag, maybe, you know, augment my pension. But uh, the industry, auto industry, says that what they want is 98, what's called research octane number, which roughly corresponds to the 93 octane that in premium gasoline today. Now, ideally, you'd want this to be made with proven components because the history of boosting octane has not been good. They've used uh, started out with lead, then they used MMT, then they used other compounds. They all got banned for environmental reasons. So it's really nice if you could start out with something that we know what the environmental effects are. So ethanol fills the bill for that. It's already successful in E10. So if you add more to the gasoline, to the blend stock, to bring the octane up to 98 RON, to where premium is, uh, you would create a fuel that would allow the auto manufacturers to increase engine compression ratios and improve efficiency, meaning lower CO2 emissions, better mileage, but also they're finding, and the national labs have been doing a lot of work on this, when they actually run, the, run this in the labs, they're finding that it does more it enhances combustion, and they're not really sure exactly why this combination does that, but there's a lot of excited engineers out there wanting to find out why. At the National Labs, they found if you would use this new fuel and 
optimize the vehicles with higher compression ratio, you would have equal or better fuel economy, about 7 to 10 percent lower tailpipe CO2 emissions, and what makes <clears throat> us engineers excited, double the engine torque. So now you have a choice of either improving the performance of the vehicle or downsizing the engines uh, to get even better fuel economy and lower CO2 emissions. Now, it's cleaner, as I mentioned, because lower CO2 emissions and also lower toxics, because in order to take gasoline at the refinery and boost its octanes, you've got to use a lot of um, compounds that, while they're not benzene, they are very similar to benzene. So uh, the advantage of ethanol is you avoid that. Also, as I pointed out, it's cheaper. Cheaper per gallon now. The price is going to go down even more. So you can see that if you went from, let's say, 10% now to 30% in EPF, you would be boosting, or you would be boosting the octane to what the auto industry wants, and you'd be lowering the price. Now, assuming the oil industry would then pass all of that on to the consumers, which is another discussion entirely I don't have time for, the consumer, if you did it today, would start, or in the near future, would see about 20 cents a gallon less than regular gasoline today, and they'd be getting a gasoline that had the octane of premium. And that would increase by 2035 to 40%, or to 40 cents a gallon, a substantial savings at the pump. Now, bottom line is this is a low-cost way to meet our national energy goals. Reduce green oil dependence and also uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions. You've got a number of programs that have been instituted to accomplish this, but most of them cost the consumer money. And just as a quick comparison, if you take a look at an electric car versus uh, eco performance fuel, a uh, Tesla, it costs about close to $500 to, for each ton of carbon dioxide that you reduce. Now, okay, I'll wrap up real quick, only one more slide. The EPF, it's three to nine dollars savings. So, I won't go through this real quickly other than to say, if you compare it to other renewables, ethanol is unique in that while no renewable can completely at this point of time replace all fossil fuels, only ethanol displaces both displaces fossil fuel by about the same amount as some of these other renewables, but also saves the consumer money. And in that regard, if we can maximize its utility through EPF, consumers will save more money, the economy will be stronger, and we will be using a whole lot less oil. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dean. Well, that was a really good sort of trip through a whole lot of questions, I think, that have been. That was a problem with the microphone. Right. Um, so our apologies. Anyway, in terms of looking at a sort of a lot of the issues, I think, around which there has been a lot of um, confusion and also questions that have come up, and certainly that we at ESI have been hearing over the last few years. And, and of course, one of the things that I always think is so interesting, too, is with regard to thinking about um, uh, biofuels refineries, thinking about ethanol plants, are all of the revenue streams, all of the products, all the co-products that really come out of that, which I think is not well understood. And of course, Stefan and Michael um, also talked about that uh, as well. So at this time, let's open it up for your questions. And, and of course, I know while some of the slides were difficult to see, uh, they will all be posted on EESI's website uh, and, and of course the video made available to you. Uh, any questions? And if you could identify yourself, please. Doug, go ahead. Um, I get that the natural gasoline low octane, because you can grab 100 or so with the 85 anyway, is the energy content the same, number one, and the, the other question related to your, uh, related to your presentation. 32% uh, hit on energy seems to be, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen a number that high. Um, 
you know, that the energy debit's that high. We've always used 23, 25, something like that. So that seems a little, little aggressive, but um, tying into the natural gas lane, would you still have to debit it that much, uh, depending on the energy content of the natural gas lane? So I understand the octane's giveaway, but how does that affect the energy? And then related, now that E85 is legally uh, described uh, by ASTM as, as, as having as low as 51% ethanol, how does that affect all of that? So I just think, I, I think we're discounting too much, you know, as, a, as, as biofuel advocates, where, you know, we acknowledge that the BTU is lower, but I think we're giving away too much because of those factors. So uh, those, the, that's what I was wondering about. Thank you. Good question. Right. There, is it on? It's on. Wonderful. Uh, to your first question about natural gasoline, uh, it was very difficult to find information on the energy content of natural gasoline, but what I did find tended to indicate it had about 90% the energy of oil. So when we did our calculations, we factored that number in on the cost because we always adjusted for energy. Um, as far as our energy content numbers, uh, I'd be interested to see yours. Those were the numbers we came up with using the standard 74%, uh, E85 actually being 74% ethanol, um, and tried to factor in the denaturing. Now, in our case, we use the lowest amount of denaturing, 2%. It can go up to 5 and that impacts the amount of energy in the final product. Um, so... Basically, that's what we uh, did there, and like I said, I'd hope to see your calculations and see how they differ from ours. Maybe it's just a matter of using the lower denaturing number of 2%. And I'm old, so I forget the third part of your question. Ah. Okay, well, that's an interesting thing I didn't have time to put in my presentation. When I did the calculations, what the uh, ethanol producers are selling in the yellow hose program is not really E85 or even E74. It's E70 because that right now in Michigan is the lowest you can go and legally sell it as E85. Obviously, if you could turn E85 into an even lower uh, percentage, like, e, as you say, E51, and the oil industry could use start using a low-octane, low-cost blend stock that would be similar to natural gasoline, because not a lot of that natural gasoline around, and you don't want to drive up the price. But there's no reason you couldn't use a much lower octane gasoline that would be a lot cheaper. You could start marketing all E85 or now E51 much, much less. Because already with this E70, you can do it at a dollar a gallon less than regular. So you could go lower than that with E51. Okay. Uh, Stefan or Michael, did you want to comment or...? I think you know, thirty-two percent is reasonable. I think what you mean is uh, pure ethanol versus uh, pure gasoline, and uh, you know, we all know the BTU contact in ethanol versus uh, gasoline. Of course, now we we can use E10 as the benchmark. That's a little bit lower heating contact versus E ethanol uh, versus E100. And, uh, I have not seen any efficiency gain in E10 or E85. So as now as you do not have efficiency gain on the vehicle side, your BTU contact difference is the main driver. Okay. Um, any other? Okay, right here. <laughs> okay, here comes the microphone. My question is on the... Uh, price of ethanol, and is that driven through, you said the tariffs have expired, is that driven for what's coming in through Brazil, and if we actually do higher contents of ethanol in our vehicles outside of the fuel compatibility and the fuel systems, I'll leave that for another discussion, um, where do you see the price of ethanol going, because I'm assuming that arbitrage would close. Uh, well, very interesting you ask that, because that's one of the things that uh, Dr. Walton is currently working on in a follow-up study for Minnesota on this very concept, is 
uh, the issue of volumes. And that's very important because, you know, there's going to be some point at which the use of ethanol will expand to the point it starts driving things, prices up. But there seems to be a lot more potential for conventional ethanol or corn ethanol in the United States. There's also considerable ability to expand ethanol production, cane ethanol production in Brazil. And one of the things that I found surprising is that also in Brazil, they are beginning to use more corn ethanol because there seems, to, and I'm not a farmer, you know, I work for the farmers, but I can't even grow a house plant. But as I understand it, the bean, I think it's bean crop and corn crop can be uh, grown in the same field because they harvest the bean crop and then there's time to grow corn. So they're even building corn ethanol plants in Brazil. So our preliminary studies indicate that for the amount of gas uh, ethanol that would be needed for eco-performance fuel, given the timeline that you would have, the gradual ramp up, it doesn't look like you're going to hit the point at which the price of ethanol is going to start ramping up because there seems to be sufficient, you know, given enough time to develop it. And that's important because you have to have the time for these things to develop that you shouldn't run into that problem. You use much more ethanol, though, and you could run into uh, some price spikes. But No, no. Uh, the, my discussion is for spark ignition engines only. There is a whole parallel effort on using gasoline in compression ignition you know, diesels. And uh, what's interesting about that is that uh, they're talking about a very, very low octane gasoline almost the kind of thing you'd want to blend into E85, but using it in a diesel. Uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, there's a book, uh, Engine Fuel Interactions, that's available through Society of Automotive Engineers, uh, written by chief researcher at Saudi Aramco, Ramco, that discusses this issue of future fuels. And he says that, you know, the future fuel for spark ignition engines is a high-octane gasoline, and that ethanol would be important in making that. So this isn't a wild and crazy idea, but it ties in with the need then to have diesel engines that run on very low octane. And that way you maximize the amount of uh, energy you can get out of a barrel of oil. Okay, okay thank you. Bill, go ahead. Do you want to identify yourself? Okay, the sweet spot is uh, for engineers is 98 research octane number, which is equivalent to our today's premium that has a 93 anti-knock index. The anti-knock index is an average of research octane number and motor octane number divided by two. Um, in high technology engines, direct injection into the cylinder, the only one of those two, I'm sorry, the only one of those two that count is a research octane number. So that's, in the rest of the world, they use that instead of the anti-knock index. So the research octane number is the one to focus on, and that would be 98 RON. And it turns out that, yes, you know, it's kind of one of these curves that goes like this. And so at 98 RON, there really isn't a lot more to be gained. You know, that gets you up to around 12 and a half, 13 to 1 compression ratio something that hasn't been seen since the days of the 69 Corvette, um, and creates a very, very efficient engine, and going much more than that, because diesels have come down in compression ratio. They're down around 16 to 1. So uh, what happens is technology is kind of converging into very high compression spark ignition engines and lower compression diesel engines that could be built out of the same engine block, engine transfer line. The old diesel, yes. We tried it, it didn't work, but then again, this is a whole new technology out there. Plus the engine would have to, the gas engine would be reinforced to take the higher compression ratio. Better 
Well, this whole issue of octane reading and gasoline mileage is an interesting one because uh, there are some circumstances with certain advanced technologies where a little additional octane might get you better fuel economy. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a lot of myth and fables about octane and fuel economy. So you have a placebo effect kind of thing going on at the same time. And there's never been a good test program to separate the two. Um, but one of the things that happens in modern engines is you have something called a knock sensor. So it actually detunes the engine if it senses it's not getting enough octane. And that can create some problems that maybe a little more octane can fix. But again, there's not been a valid test program to verify it. There's a lot of uh, uh, myths out there. So, But it is possible. And in fact, I was... I did see some research on various FFVs that have been optimized to run on high octane, or have been optimized to run on E85, but still can run on 87 octane, and they show that effect quite prominently, that they get better gas mileage on the uh, higher ethanol blends. An advertisement for my old employer, Buick Regal is one of them, Buick Regal Turbo. Okay. Anything, any other comments? Because I, I wanted to ask uh, all of you that since the, there has been so much discussion uh, on Capitol Hill over the course of the last year, couple years, with regard to the renewable fuel standard, and while you've all sort of talked about it in, or at least indirectly, Given what you know about all of that discussion and the impending EPA uh, uh, decisions with regard to looking at volumes, what, what would you say are key things that you would really like to make sure that policymakers are really aware of based upon your work, your knowledge, and what you know of the discussion? Who wants to start? Go ahead, Stefan. Well, I, I can start. And, and I think I, uh, I said the same thing last December at the uh, RVS2 RVO hearing, um, December 6, I think it was, in D.C. And I pointed out in my, in my presentation, you know, again, you know, while I think the RFS2 is a, is a good thing and, you know, encouraging technologies to go into corn ethanol plants, I think we need to update the modeling to reflect the latest science, the latest efficiencies um, at corn ethanol plants. And in, in, this is also true for CARP, um, California Air Resources Board uh, modeling, um, which still relies on also um, somewhat outdated data. So I think you know the, it's a rapid, rapidly improving field, and we need to be um, pushing that the newest science is being adopted in this modeling exercises. Okay, Michael? We're, uh, we're not in policy recommendation area, we're in research area from our <laughs> National Laboratory. <laughs> so I would say from a research point of view, what I see in the last uh, several years, as I elaborate in my presentation, in the last uh, several years, the technology advancement, I think uh, many people, if not all, agree with what we have achieved uh, in farming and in ethanol plant. What we've been debating and, uh, and uh, with uh, some uncertainty is uh, land use change. So in the last uh, six years, as you saw from that summary slide, there are many organizations involved in uh, modeling land use change issues. and. Uh, the key factors were identified. So what are the causes for the large variations among the studies since uh, 2008? Uh, so for those of us involved in this specific uh, research topic, we have a good sense of what caused the variations. Uh, we, you know, the data starts to show up so where the data lead us. And so I think instead of each organization continue to pursue 
the community needs to you know, sit down together to go over and say, okay, so do we agree the critical factors and uh, where the data lead us or the assumptions about the critical factors so we can uh, have some clarity of this important uh, factor itself. Okay, thank you. Dean? Okay. Um, I guess from an economics point of view, and I'm not an economist, but you know, like the old show I, or saying, I play one on television. Um, Dr. Walton is our economist, and I picked up a lot of economics from him. And there's a couple of things regarding the RFS we've talked about. The first one, if you look at the RFS and the whole structure of it, there's this so-called blend wall that you hear a lot about. In other words, the blend wall is the 10% I'm talking about that's already in gasoline. That consumers accept, it's transparent, it saves the money, the oil companies seem to be happy with it. Um, going beyond the so-called blend wall, it was envisioned you'd use E85. And up until recently, there's been no proof that that's economically attractive to customers. But as I pointed out, it's never been tried with a low-octane blend stock. Now that it's being tried, the question is open whether you can sell enough E85 to flexible fueled vehicles to make up the difference for RFS2. But what I'm talking about with eco-performance fuel is another thing entirely. It's raising the blend wall because it raises it to 30% or roughly whatever that number happens to be that creates this optimum fuel. And just as E10 is no problem for the oil companies, E30 shouldn't be either. And finally, as far, and this may seem like a nitpick, pick, but Dr. Walt and I spent quite a few years working on alternate regulatory systems and cap and trade, and really the RIN program is a cap and trade program. But if you look at the fundamentals of cap and trade, it's a fairly inefficient one. So a lot of improvements could be made by simplifying it and creating some features that, uh, by our analysis, about half of the RIN price is actually uh, due to the essential economics of ethanol and the other half is due to some of the inefficiencies in the RIN program. That could be worked out of the system and create a more efficient system. But basically the RFS I think has to be there right now until, if you will, the unlikely partners of the oil companies and the ethanol producers learn to work together to integrate. Because, you know, ethanol producers right now, like the oil companies, are an essential fuel to the United States. And, but there doesn't seem, from an outsider's perspective, that they get along too well. And so until they do, the RFS is probably a very important policy instrument to make sure the American people get the lowest cost fuel possible. Okay, thank, thank you. And I also wanted to mention that in, as far as EESI is concerned, we had thought that it was very important to put together kind of a series of a forum to really look at the whole uh, range of, of issues around biofuels and wanted to start off by really looking at what is happening with regard to life cycle analysis, to updates in technologies as we've, as we've heard today. And then this will be followed by a briefing on the afternoon of October 6th, Monday, October 6th, in terms of taking a look at the cellulosic um, uh, ethanol. There's been a lot of discussion about that, about what's really going on with regard to the technologies. Um, and they are an important piece of the renewable fuel standard. Uh, again, there have been lots of questions raised about is anything happening? Is this going to become commercial? Well, at that briefing, we're going to have four uh, companies that are dealing with commercial production of cellulosic biofuels and looking at different kinds of feedstocks. And then we hope to take a look at aviation biofuels. There's so much exciting work that's going on in that whole area as well. So if you've got other questions for, any, for our speakers or for us, uh, we would welcome them, and as Michael said, it's really, really important that people come together to really look at issues to make sure that we really are discussing and problem solving so that we really look at things in a holistic way and can really move 
um, issues dealing with energy, environment, uh, greenhouse gases to help solve and move all of these issues forward in a positive way. So I want to say thank you to our speakers. I thought that was very, very helpful. Thank you.